Good morning, everyone. Yeah, audience participation, I love it. We're gonna get started. Um, there's uh, almost 400 people registered. Where, where is everybody? Is everybody hung over? Where is everybody? <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome to the second annual Cat Chat. I, uh, I, I thought you were applauding. I was like, yeah, go ahead, applaud. This is a great, <laughs> this is a great event. We're gonna have a ton of fun today. Um, it's, an, it's honestly an absolute honor to host this, this particular event. This is one of my favorites. I love the taste of Jaywoo, but I really like this one. So my name is Sarah Sorelli. I'm a graduate from class of 2007. I am the head of marketing for a top 100 accounting and consulting firm by the name of Grassi in New York City. I have uh, a lot of fun leading just a tremendously talented marketing team and helping Grassi grow and helping our clients grow. Um, but unfortunately, today is not about me. Uh, it's about three sets of uh, really, just really incredible presenters. So I do love what I do, but um, you know, my, my main passion is just hanging out with awesome people, doing awesome things. And if you are the average of the people that you hang out with, then this is exactly the room that I want to be in because our presenters are fantastic. So uh, here's what's going to go down today. You're going to hear from three sets of presenters and our guest faculty members are going to speak second and our alumni are going to speak first, except in the first case where our faculty member will speak first and our alum will speak second. And then each of these uh, speakers, they were selected from their passion and they're out in different industries making a real impact and we're gonna get a, a real inside look and some pretty cool things today, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then we have somebody or a few people that'll be walking around with microphones so you'll get to ask any questions you may have. So we'll do that. We'll do two speakers, questions, two speakers, questions, two speakers, questions. And then directly after this event, we're gonna go over to the Taste of Jaywoo. So Liza says that the shuttles will be picking you up in that general direction. That was exactly uh, what she told me to do. So where, where are these? We don't know. Uh, okay, that's, see, again, she just, they're over there somewhere. So we have transportation that'll take you over to there. So that's another great event. Is it anybody's first reunion? Quite a few, okay, welcome, that's great. Um, also, uh, this is streaming live, so if you're interested in watching it again or sharing it with anyone else, streaming live, so I know my mom and dad are watching somewhere, so hi mom and dad. Uh, we'll make sure that we get you that link and you can watch it again. So you ready to get started? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to introduce our first speaker. So Todd Seafarth is department chair and associate professor of culinary nutrition in the College of Culinary Arts and graduate of 2001. So according to Chef Todd, the key to a happy and healthy lifestyle is the understanding that food must both nourish as well as satisfy the body. As a registered dietitian that began his career as a traditional chef, Todd brings a unique insight to the role of food as both a vehicle for pleasure, which is how I use it, as well as good health. So his biggest passion is utilizing food and nutrition to maximize human performance as well as training open-minded chefs on the basic culinary nutrition techniques needed to satisfy any dietitian's requests. So please join me in welcoming up Chef Todd. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Todd Seaforth. I've been with the university for a little over a decade now, and uh, it's been uh, quite an amazing journey. And what I want to talk to you today about is the culinary nutrition program and kind of how that program has helped with the evolution uh, of education at the College of Culinary Arts. So when, the first, uh, when we first tried to introduce this program, it was to train chefs to be dietitians, not train dietitians to cook, but train cooks to be dietitians. And it was not very well received when it was first introduced in the late 90s, uh, and it, because it didn't really fit within the model of what uh, Johnson Wales was at the time. But we pushed it through. We got about 35 students in the first graduating class. Uh, we uh, quickly were uh, approved by Katie, which is now Ascend, which is the Accreditation Council on Nutrition and, and Dietetics Education. And they allowed our graduates to go off and become registered dietitians, which is uh, the credential that um, nutrition experts get. Uh, we graduated our first class in 2001. Since we started in 1999, we are 20 years old now. 
And uh, one of the things that uh, we started with uh, was a model that anybody that graduated from any of the culinary related degrees uh, before 2005, 2010 is familiar with this, the two plus two model, where the students came in for culinary arts and then we had to cram everything that the student needed to know about nutrition into two years while still meeting all the other uh, requirements. So uh, when we first graduated, we were obviously putting out the registered dietitians, which was the goal of the program, but we also just naturally because of the food science focus within that program, we were putting out research and development chefs that went off and worked for large food companies. And then we also had the uh, chefs that just wanted to go and work in spas, private chefs, and wanted to just cook healthy. And that's where we started. The philosophy has always been food focused first. Uh, uh, like I said earlier, we wanted to make sure that food was at the, the forefront. Uh, dietetics over the last 20, 30 years has really become more and more removed from food and food production. Um, but if you think about dietetics, uh, nutrition is a science, but the currency of that uh, science is food. So we started there. Now on top of that, we throw in a significant amount of academics, making sure the student understands not only uh, nutrition, but also policies, regulations, and all that kind of stuff that uh, somebody who's working in a healthcare environment needs to face. We then throw in some food science because it's much easier to replace fats, salts, sugars uh, if you know what they're actually doing and understand principles on how to replace it. And then we have unique faculty. This is John Poirot. He now teaches the performance uh, uh, nutrition class. Uh, and he comes to us from the Army. And what's really cool about that is uh, I was trained more academically on uh, sports nutrition, but he was actually working with the soldier athlete, the athlete without a season. Uh, and that brings a really unique perspective to it. And he's a registered dietitian as well. And then Johnson Wales, uh, the one of the things that we do better than most other institutions is we make sure the students learn by doing. And that has always been um, uh, kind of at our core. This is a student that is presenting their menu to a uh, table full of athletes at a training table event where they actually invite in students to work. Um, the program now is, is really designed to make sure that we are putting out um, uh, nutrition and healthcare food service professionals and leaders. We always have had a focus on interprofessional uh, understanding. So we have our dietitian students working with our chef students, working with our food science uh, students. So when they're out in industry, they understand how to work collaboratively uh, uh, across different disciplines. And we are really addressing a knowledge gap that exists in the field right now because if you want to be a dietitian, you go to this school. If you want to be a chef, you go to this school. And being able to put it together, we really are giving the students a really unique opportunity at Johnson & Wales. When we look at the program now, uh, starting back in 2017, we started splitting up the program into three unique degree paths. So the students can really get a customized experience. What the smartest thing that the college did at this point was they also created a common first year for all these degrees. So if you came in for an associate's degree, food science, culinary science, uh, uh, nutrition, dietetics, you all start with a common foundational knowledge. So everybody goes through the program understanding it. And students that don't know exactly what they want to do for the rest of their lives at age 18 or 17 now have an opportunity to kind of keep their head on a swivel and see what Johnson Wales is offering. And it really is an amazing opportunity. But I'm here today to talk about sports nutrition. So we have done really well in this field. And uh, the question is, how did we get into it? How did we become, uh, carve out a little niche here? And the answer is we got lucky. Um, when I was taking this, uh, the, the sports nutrition class, when I took it over um, back in the mid-2000s, um, we were really using a lot of the material that was geared towards the weekend warrior, the long distance runner, the power athlete, because that's what was being published. But these people don't hire chefs, so it wasn't really a practical skill set. Um, so we were looking at coupling with uh, uh, colleges and professional teams to make sure that we were teaching the students exactly what they needed. So we had that foundation in food, we had learning by doing, but we also had this great opportunity because in 2014, the NC2A deregulated how the, uh, you were able to feed an athlete. And it went from only being able to feed them one meal a day to being able to feed them whatever the heck you wanted, whenever the heck you wanted. So all of a sudden there was this big kind of gold rush to try to get more nutrition focused chefs, more critically thinking chefs into college sports, which is where we have had incredible success. We've also coupled with a, uh, several professional organizations, most prominently the CPSDA, which is the worst acronym ever, uh, but it's the Collegiate Professional Sports Dietitians Association. But they have been incredible to make sure that they are, are helping us not only place students in jobs, but also validate our curriculum. So uh, have we had successes in this arena? We definitely have, both as dietitians and chefs. So with our registered dietitians, and I, I've got to fish out the years, because I, uh, 
I can't remember every year that the students graduated. But we have Adam Corzin, uh, who went out and worked with the U.S. Olympic Committee, then worked with U.S. Ski, and is now with the uh, Green Bay Packers. And he graduated in 03. Tyrone, who's now the dietitian chef for the L.A. Dodgers, he graduated in 05. Sean Zell, um, he started with the L.A. Rams and is now out with the Milwaukee Bucks. They seem to be doing all right. Go Celtics. Uh, and we have Nick, who's now with the Celtics, uh, even though he's wearing a, uh, a Memphis shirt. Now, in addition, we have our most recent uh, sports dietitian, which is uh, Alexa, who is now working with the Gamecocks. So incredible success in this arena. But we also have people that don't necessarily want to go through the process of becoming a dietitian and just want to cook. And this is Noel and JJ. Uh, Noel graduated in 16 and JJ graduated in 15. They are, uh, uh, have worked as uh, the performance chefs for uh, the Red Sox as well as the Eagles. And you can see that they, uh, they were celebrated as part of the team. Um, along there, we have Haley, who is with uh, Clemson right now. She graduated in 16. We have um, uh, Bryson and Varun, who graduated in 12 and, and 02. Um, and these uh, people are now working in Premier League soccer and working with the World Cup. And we've also coupled with uh, organizations like Exos that train people uh, 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 how to eat better as well as train better. Uh, so great, great opportunities. And one of our best partnerships is with the University of Alabama. And we have, we have four students in this mix. Uh, we have Sam, Julian, uh, Kevin, and Lily, uh, who graduated in, in 2018, 2017, 2016, and also 2018. Uh, and you can see them here. Uh, kind of celebrating out on the field with, with the team. Uh, Amy Bragg, which Kevin will talk about, but, but the gentleman in the, in the center there is now the executive chef uh, for Alabama um, Crimson Tide, and he went from intern to executive chef in just a couple years, and how did he get that? He'll tell you about it, but he's also uh, a very humble gentleman, but he had a unique set of skills and had that opportunity uh, placed in front of him. So uh, if we can introduce Kevin, have him come up. Well done. Thank you so much, Todd. All right, so now we're going to introduce Kevin Murray, graduate of 2016, which you just heard a little bit about. So Kevin is the executive performance chef of the University of Alabama. How cool is that? Uh, so I was surprised to learn it's more than just 85 cups of coffee that fuels these interns, because that's how I feel literally everything I do. If you don't start, thank you for that one laugh that meant a lot to me. Uh, if you, it's gonna be a long 90 minutes if you don't buy into this now. All right, so he travels with the football team. He assures road game meals are running smoothly, works with game day sideline as part of the performance nutrition staff, assisting student athletes with hydrating, fueling. He was telling us so much about this last night. There's so much more that goes into this than you would ever imagine. He has to get there before the athletes get there. He works with hotel staff. Uh, so he's going to talk about actually what goes into feeding these athletes and directly impacting their performance, which is a lot of pressure, I would imagine. He has the coolest job. So everybody, please welcome Kevin. Good morning. Thank you, Sarah, chef. Um, so yes, my name is Kevin Murray. I graduated in 2016. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I was able to do an internship at the University of Alabama my senior year. Uh, I did a winter trimester. And uh, I worked my tail off because uh, I was working for the GOAT, right? The Coach Saban and then also the GOAT in sports nutrition, Amy Bragg. Uh, she, I owe a lot of my success to her. Um, but I was worked my tail off because I knew that there weren't many opportunities out there at the time when I was doing my internship. So I, so I had to prove myself, right? Whether it was getting a letter of recommendation or Luckily enough, uh, they actually created a job for me in the dining hall to be the sous chef there, the performance sous chef, right? Um, I love, I fell in love with the University of Alabama. I love it. I loved it so much that I actually did a demo at 3 a.m. for gymnastics, right? So like these cute little girls, they're like 4'11". They're leaving to go to their national championship, uh, the round of six. Uh, 5 a.m. flight, they're flying to California, and uh, I did a demo for them. Did some omelets. Uh, they loved it. It was great, right? Um, but we were starting to build a new dining facility, right? We wanted a place where the student athletes can come eat because the old dining hall, uh, everybody could come eat there. And that wasn't very optimal for fueling them, right? Having uh, a place that wasn't uh, built just for them, they're very specific in what they need. So we wanted to build an area for them that they can come dine and feel comfortable as well because dining with the average student, you can imagine some higher profile athletes weren't comfortable there, right? People are constantly asking for autographs, pictures. It, was, it wasn't good. So we wanted, we wanted to create a home-like environment for them. 
And uh, I was actually able to um, be a part of the design process. And then during that whole time, uh, I was asked to be the executive performance chef when we built this brand new $20 million facility. So um, I haven't looked back since, and I'm very excited to be here. But uh, you may be asking, all right, so like, what do you do? Why am I even here, right? Um, I'm here to help Alabama win. That's, that's the key. Uh, I'm here to help them win, not only on the field, but also off the field. Um, it's my job to put back into the student athlete what their sport demands of them, right? They're very busy. Student athletes have a very busy schedule, uh, especially elite athletes, right? They have practice. They have class, they have tutoring, they have homework that they have to do, they have workouts, they have meetings, and all this is mandatory, right? I didn't even mention their social lives that they have to have to balance it and their meals, right? So how do I do it, right? I got a really big team, and I'm very lucky. As, as I mentioned before, Miss Amy Bragg right there, she's the GOAT. She actually started the CPSDA with a few other members who have been trailblazing the industry in sports nutrition for the past 16, 20 years. Uh, also, some JWU alum that I want to recognize, uh, Sam Dow, he graduated in 2017. He's our performance sous chef now. Uh, Julian Franklin, who is our uh, front of house manager. And then Sam Sears, that's me, Sam Sears. Uh, he is uh, our diet tech. And what he does is he actually helps me write the recipes and helps make sure that the kitchen staff is following because a big thing that Johnson & Wales preaches and sets us up for is being that liaison between the dietitian and the culinary staff because you know not everybody is lucky enough to have this education that we get here so they're they're um, they basically learn from us which is a really cool experience to be able to teach people about what we were taught here and then uh, like chef Sagarth shouted out Lily uh, Lily no longer works with us she actually moved on to be uh, a chef at a catering company in Nevada but uh, she did great for us, and I'm very happy to have all these people as part of the team. Uh, so you may be saying, Kevin, all right, so how do you fuel the athlete, right? And uh, I just want to start off by saying, uh, you know, there's no really like one size fit all diet. You know, we're not going around saying, oh, you know, keto is the best diet or anything like that. We don't do that, right? So really the only option is customizable and individualized diets. And a big way that we like to do that is actually built into the dining hall. You can see in the picture in the top left there and in the bottom right, uh, in the top left is actually a rendering of our upstairs dining hall, uh, like the upstairs, second floor, right? And everything's made of glass for a specific reason. They're able to see their options. They're able to pick their options. And right there is an actual photo in the bottom right of an omelet bar. And what that helps us do is the, the athletes are very uh, receptive. And instead of just saying, oh yeah, like, you have omelets, let me get like a meat lover's omelet. They're able to walk up, see their options, and they could say, hey, Kev, hey, I like tomatoes, I like spinach, mushrooms, turkey, cheese, let me get that in my omelet. And what that helps them do is that helps them make conscious decisions that not only help them now, but for the future, right? So they're building their plates, they're getting micronutrients that are very important, you know, anti-inflammatory properties, things like that, that help them. And then also, a big thing that I like to stress and that I preach on and I've probably beat into these folks for the past like f two weeks is it's all about the relationship, right? They're not able to do that. They're not able to come up to me and say that if I don't have a good relationship with them. It also reflects that in the menu, right? Because my job is to fuel the athlete. I can serve quinoa all I want, right? But if nobody eats it, they're not getting the calories. They're not getting the things that they need to fuel themselves to be successful. They're not able to recover, rehydrate, refuel, right? and keep going. So having that relationship with them, listening to them, and taking their input on the menu as well is very important to me. Also, I don't know if anybody here has ever cooked for any Cajun people, you know, those crazy people that live in Louisiana, but you don't want to piss them off and mess up their food. <laughs> Quick note, never put tomatoes in gumbo. Learn, learn that the hard way. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, but I also need to make sure that uh, all of our food is not only tastes good and looks good, but also it has to be geographically correct from the location that it's from, right? So we have athletes from all over the world, not just the country. So talked about those crazy Cajuns, right? And then we also have people from Spain, Egypt, Italy, Greece, Canada, you name it. Like, it's crazy. So being able to provide the athletes all these types of menu items, and then being able to execute well. Johnson Wells has really set us up for success, and that really goes back to the, my team that I have, and I'm very lucky to have them. But um, 
basically, you have to consider not just that, but also I'm feeding those little gymnasts that I was talking about, and I also have to make sure the old linemen are satisfied as well. It's, it's about providing options. So a typical like dinner is we'll have like three protein options, two starches, two vegetables. We'll have an action station like I was talking about. And then we also have this thing called the power protein grill, which I'll get into a little later. Um, but another part of my job that I love so much is being able to do demos and teaching uh, the student athletes life skills, right? Helping them to set up for success later on. So you can see in the top right there, I think I'm right, no, the top left. Uh, we did a little demo with the volleyball girls and they, uh, we were teaching them how to cook omelets uh, because I like a lot of the demos to reflect some of the action stations that we do in the dining hall so they can kind of keep seeing it and learning, you know, repetition, it's good. Um, and then they wanted to get cute with it, you know, they wanted to plate it up, as you can see right there. Uh, they wanted to plate up, you know, play a little Gordon Ramsay or whatever, take pictures of the food. Uh, their head coach was actually the judge that day, and it was really fun. And then also uh, in the top right, uh, we did a little demo for softball. And what that was, it was like healthy snacks, right? So you can see in the bottom left there, we did like overnight oats, good way to start the morning, breakfast. And then also we did protein balls with them, so quick snack throughout the day, keep them going. And then um, I work with football mostly, right? As uh, Sarah said. So a lot of my good relationships are actually with the football guys. Um, being able to uh, take care of them every day and talk to them every day, it's very important to me. Uh, keep that relationship strong. Uh, you can see right there, Miller Forrestal holding the steak like this. Uh, he just came up to me one day and was like, yo Kev, I love medium rare steak but I don't know how to cook it. I always overcook it. How do I do it? I was like, cool, come to dinner after practice, I'll show you. So this power protein grill that we have, right? We, that offers steak, chicken, and fish every single night off the grill, every single night. So what we did, we just went out there, showed them the ropes, showed them the little hand technique, you know, that cool stuff. Nothing wrong with a thermometer, no shame in that. Guarantees perfection every time. And now every time he cooks a steak, I don't get a text about it. I get it every single time. And then top right, got it. Top right, we have Minga Fitzpatrick. He was actually drafted in the first round last year by the Miami Dolphins, and uh, I'm a Giants fan, but his first pick was against Tom Brady, so I was pretty happy about that. I don't know about any Pats fans out there. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but he saw us, before we had this brand new dining facility, we had this little player's lounge, right? And he saw us making fried rice, and he wanted to learn. He wanted he was interested, right? He saw how much fun we were having doing it, so he wanted to get back there. He threw on the coat, whipped it up, and there he goes, fried rice, and he has that for the rest of his life. He's able to do that for the rest of his life for his girlfriend, his kids, whoever. So being able to provide the student athletes education like that is quintessential to their growth. And I'm just very lucky to be a small piece of the puzzle, you know, a small cog in the wheel, whatever however you want to call it. But uh, that, that's just what I, I, I love about my job the most. And then, last story, and then I'll shut up. Uh, so there's this one kid who uh, always asked for a steak well done, right? Always, constantly. And he would say it was burnt or overcooked every single time. And I was like, I don't know how, how we're not doing this right, right? It was like a week straight. So I looked at Sam one day, and I was like, let's just do it the way we know it'll be good. Let's just cook it for a medium, right? Why not? And he came up to me. And I've never been dapped up. You guys know what dapping up is, right? The little, like, I've never been dapped up so hard. I thought it broke my hand. He was like, that's it. That's it, my dog. That's it. You got it. And I was like, so we call it the waddle well done now. That's a medium steak. But uh, <laughs> that's all I got. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Great. That's so great. All right, so let's, uh, I think we have a microphone. Okay, so we have a microphone going around. Does anybody have any questions? Let's get a question. We'll take a minute or two. Uh, the topic is food. It's like the best thing to talk about. So um, anybody? Yeah, all right. What course did you go after you did your preliminary? What of the three tasks did you do? I have to do this. Repeat so, the question. So he asked, yep. what course did I go to after I did the preliminary? And I actually didn't. Uh, I was before they did this new restructured, so I had uh, two years of culinary arts, so I had chefs like Chef Deladon, who's 
total badass. I don't know if I could say that on live TV or whatever, but I did. Uh, <laughs> teaching me things like New World Cuisine and traditional European, stuff like that. And then I was uh, applied, phone interview, Chef Safarth, uh, for the nutrition program. And then I was able to learn from professors like Professor LaRose, uh, Professor Robinson, and then chefs as well like Chef Poirot or Makuch. So uh, 2017 is when the freshman class came in. So before the freshman class of 2017, they only had one choice, culinary nutrition, which had three different pathways within that curriculum. So the, the new pathway is much more customized towards what the students want. Uh, and the university has really expanded out into allied health and we have biology degrees now, we have a PA program, we have a doctorate in occupational therapy. So the university is really kind of growing and expanding out um, uh, incredibly and it, being able to utilize a lot of those resources uh, either through a student's choice for electives or or to being able to utilize those courses within the majors has been an incredible asset uh, to our programs. Let's get one more question. Anybody? Right here? Uh, no, so we'll stay at a hotel. Um, I'll go early and then I'll just kind of like immerse myself into the culinary staff there. Luckily, most of them are JLU grads, <laughs> so they're pretty cool, you know. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody knows, but chefs kind of have egos sometimes, so like someone just coming and saying this is how we're going to do it is, you know, sometimes a little touchy-feely. But uh, we have a standard and there's really one ego that I care about and it's coach. And that's the only one that matters in the building, so I just make sure it gets done. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause, guys. Thank you so much. I think that guy's got a question. You might be out of time. To be Get me later. <laughs> Roll time. <tie. laughs> Excellent. All right, we're going to move on to our second duo. Would you forget? He forgot his phone. Okay. All right, so let's all take a moment. I'd like to introduce Alexa Espinal. Alexa, you can come on up here. Alexa is a field. She deserves that. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you finish that. Um, Alexa is a field applications engineer at E Inc. So you know we work with a ton of designers, engineers, architects, and she's super humble when she gets up here and she talks. But I know how smart she is. She is she's absolutely incredible. So she was the first designer hired full time to work for the engineering company. She's been the company's link between development, customer, and sales. Her creativity has helped the company communicate end user design experiences, generate technical solutions, and successfully implement them. As a graduate designer from Johnson & Wales University, the first designer at E Inc., she has collaborated with A&D firms to compete in the IIDANE fashion show. She managed to transform electronic ink into three perfect scores, winning the Best in Show Award, which is pretty awesome. So please join me in welcoming Alexa up to the stage. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexa, and today I'm going to be talking about designing for people. So I graduated from Johnson & Wales University with a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering Design Configuration Management. After graduating from Johnson & Wales University, I ended up getting a job at E Inc. Corporation as a field application engineer. E Inc. is um, a corporate office in Berwick, Mass. Um, they were spun out from MIT Media Lab in 1997. They have about 5,000 to 10,000 employees, and they're also known as the leader in e-paper technology. Um, E-Ink creates thin film that has ink capsules in the film that allows us to see an image as soon as a small amount of power is being used. For many years, E-Ink has partnered up with Amazon, and they created the Amazon Kindle. And so this material is pretty unique because it's light on your eyes. It doesn't strain them compared to an iPad or other LEDs. It's flexible, it's paper light, and it uses low power. As time went by and you know, working with Sony or, or Amazon, um, the company realized that this film can be used for multiple purposes for different applications. And so they wanted to use the same film but this time, instead of the e-readers or tablets market, they wanted to expand in the architectural and design industry. And so, as a field application engineer, being hired as a designer in a strong engineering company, um, I'm getting familiar with the material, I'm reading a lot of market research in the architecture and design, and one day, my boss is like, okay, 
time to, to just see what you got. And so one day I get a set of scrap rolls of material and I have three months to check something out to, to uh, basically prototype, to design, to come up with different things of, of what, you know, to wow people, to inspire other architects because we have a trade show in three months. And I was just like, oh my God, no pressure. Like I'm freaking out because I have to impress my boss, but I have to make a really good reputation for the company. I have to inspire other architects and designers. And I just graduated from college and I was just like, okay, um, what can I do with this thing? You know, like <laughs> this is like Amazon Kindle, this is huge. And so I only had like three months and I took a step back and I was like, okay, I graduated from Johnson and Wales. What did I learn from college? <laughs> okay, well, professors taught me how to use AutoCAD. I know how to laser cut. I know how to 3D model. I know the solid works. I know how to drink lots of, co of coffee and problem solve Woo! and get very hyper and blah, 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 you know, draw a list of, of, of ideas. And uh, I thought about, okay, now I got to face my fear and go down to the lab all by myself, all in a clean room, and I'm gonna play with this material. So I go down and I have my cut file, I laser cut it, I come up with different designs, and I was like, wow, this is actually pretty cool. I left the lab at like 7 p.m. and I couldn't wait till, you know, I recorded the, the, the reaction of the film. It was like pretty awesome, it was flexible and it was changing. And I was just like, wow, I need to show this to my colleagues. So I sent a video and they were really impressed with it. And I showed my boss and he was like, okay, I love it. I need you to make more of these samples and I want you to show it to the trade show at Neocon, which is an annual architectural and design show in Chicago, the Mart. I was like, okay, no problem at all. Like steel case, no Gensler, a whole bunch of design architecture and firms are going to be there. No stress at all, no intimidation, nothing at all. So. We go in and we go in the booth and we showcase these different types of samples and we had really good positive feedback. They love the idea and the history of e-ink, which is coming from black and white capsules, you know, um, the Kindles, Amazon, the only time you use you know, power is when you want to change the content. And the fact that they, instead of black and white capsules, it is now color. And so we came across, so the, the show was in June and then August time, we ended up getting a lead and it was Bergmeier, an architectural and design firm from Boston. They want to partner up with us. We are a strong engineering company, with, you know, that we have history in writing and reading tablets and they want to work with us for the International Interior Design Association New England Chapter Fashion Show. And I was just like, you want us to create dresses out of our material? Like, this is insane. <laughs> We've never done something like this. So we're like, we talked about it internally. I already built this relationship with the lab. I know this material. This material is not going to let me down. We're going to laser cut it, and we're going to create three awesome uh, models. And so I got really good feedback from these complex designs. And then we worked together with the architectural design firm, and it was really labor intensive. We only had like three months, really short lead time. And I was just like, we got this, you know, we're, we're going to build good publication for the company. We're going to show out there instead of, we're not just Kindles and e-readers, we're fashion. We, we can do medical, we can do educational stuff, we can expand. So after the, the, the manufacturing part of it, we then worked together and the big day happened, which was like the fashion show and you win awards. So as soon as the three models go up there, we can't really see everyone's reaction because we're just checking out from our perspective but we're just praying to God, we built in these sensors, we hope to God that this the three models can change the film from black to white to wow everyone at the right timing. And then um, the wards come up, you have Gensler, you have No, you have Steelcase, you have a whole bunch of companies winning all these awards and I'm just like, I worked so hard on this, like what's happening? Am I not gonna do anything or build any replication or publication for the company? And then next thing you know, they say, so the company that won Best in Show Award, E. Inc. and Bergmeier, and I was just like, oh my God, like, hard work paid off. It was just crazy. It was a very emotional um, time period for me because this, I didn't, you know, you go from a Kindle e-reader, tablet, this device to fashion. Like, how do you manage to change this? So it was definitely a great, uh, 
feedback and good publication with the company and it made us realize that we can work together and build different user experience and keep on improving our daily lives. And so you have here where we showed up in covers from Office Insight to Interior Design and kept winning innovative awards in the architectural and design industry and market. And so E-Ink right now, obviously I worked in the architecture and design market with the signage and fashion and different color changing film, but E-Ink now is working on working with other partners to create bus signs, bus signs. And so this is pretty unique and electric uh, shelf label tags, which is good for the environment. You want to reduce waste, you want to reduce printing and labor. And so if you can just design different tags or different products that allows us to save time and a lot better for the environment, that's like a win-win for us. You know, we want to continue improving. We want to increase uh, user experience. We want to build memories. Like instead of using, you know, paper and lots of trees, we want to reduce one product that can showcase multiple things. And so right up in the right, you see here, um, we just built and are currently doing installations for the Boston Transportation. Uh, for the bus, so you have the T signs here. And so basically, I want to introduce or showcase this one particularly because now today we heavily rely on energy and battery and power. And so if something goes wrong, we don't know what to do. We don't know power, you know, outages, evacuations, hurricanes, we don't know where to go. And so e this is where UNI comes into play because instead of an LED where you heavily rely on voltages and electricity and power, e ink only needs a small amount of voltage and electricity to just show a piece of content. And so if you had uh, a, me uh, a message from the community by saying emergency, evacuations, power outages, this is where you do, this is what you do uh, and where you go and you know we lose power and the content was still there originally, it's going to maintain there until you want power to actually change the content. Again, it works exactly like a Kindle, but this time it's, it's in transportation, it's being used in medical devices, it's being used in the supermarket, so this is a way to go. So we want to constantly improve user experience, but in a smarter way. So we want, you know, I just want to leave or have a message out there that you know, you went from a Kindle to fashion to different tablets or different applications that you can use worldwide and we want to continue partnering up and building user and improving user experiences. And that's it. <laughs> Nailed it. How awesome is she? That's like next level creative that I find so impressive. So that was really well done. Thank you. All right, so next up, we are going to welcome our next guest faculty speaker. So Walter Zesk is assistant professor in the College of Engineering and Design, and his three-year-old told him this morning that he doesn't look fancy with the bow tie that he's wearing, but I think he looks pretty fancy. Walter's research and professional practice straddle the border between design and engineering, primarily focusing on using emerging technologies to develop parametric product systems. As a graduate student, he collaborated on an investigation into automated folding that grew into a business called Seond. In addition, he's the co-founder of Conform Lab, which provides consulting in design automation and direct manufacturing technologies. So come on up, Walter. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Daughters are tough. A lot of honesty. So Alexa's story is really remarkable. Um, you know, she's a remarkable person. But it's indicative of a much bigger trend. Uh, so these companies, E-Ink is an example, are uh, struggling to compete in an increasingly global economy. And it's really hard to compete on price. It's hard to compete on the advantages that used to um, be maintainable, the competitive advantages that companies used to be able to build and maintain. And in an attempt to answer this question, uh, the Design Management Institute has created this uh, measure called the Design Value Index. And what, they did, what they've done is they've uh, identified companies that are making significant investments in design up and down the hierarchy of the organization, and then compared the performance of those companies to the overall, uh, I think, the S&P 500 index. And what they found is consistently these companies are dramatically outperforming um, the average, meaning that an investment in design is an investment in growth um, in a very simple way. 
And this is exactly what E-Ink did when they made the change. You know, you have a company of engineers that starts to say, well, how do we compete? How do we increase our margins? How do we grow? Let's start to think about design. So not only is, is you know, design itself a huge investment, but what we're seeing is the greatest growth um, in this investment in design is happening at the intersection between experience design and systems. So you see companies that are building ecosystems of products that are um, very sensitive to the needs of their users. Um, and, and also constantly testing out new products to see how users are responding to those products. So companies like Airbnb, companies like Facebook, companies like Google, companies like, you know, the companies that we all know, um, the biggest companies in the world. And the question is, how do we prepare students to enter into this new economy where we see all this growth in design, but it's not the industries that we, you know, traditionally think of as design industries. So it's not necessarily architecture, right? Um, you know, we have uh, students that are leaving. We want to prepare them to be able to work for a company like Facebook, to be able to work for a company like Google. Um, so we're doing that with three basic uh, concepts. The first is understanding users, right? When you want to prepare students to design for people, that sounds like a simple idea, maybe it sounds like an obvious idea, but it's not always obvious to designers. It's not always obvious to engineers, right? That's one of the key things that Alexa brought to E-Ink is a sens sensitivity to how we can take a technology, take the technology that E-Ink develops, and deploy it as a product that people really care about. Second thing is intervening in complex systems. So the products that we're creating, they're not single objects that we hand off to someone to use in a vacuum. These products are entering into these complex systems where you have sensors, you have products that are collecting data, you have products that are using data, you have products that are interacting with virtual experiences like um, interfaces that are on screens or interfaces that now are verbal. And the third thing is prototyping to create new knowledge. So this is critical. If you want to create products that matter, if you want to create products that help companies compete, you need to learn things that no one else knows. So if, you're, if the knowledge that you're using to create a product is coming from a book, is coming from Google, is coming from um, some, some generally available resource, right? Everyone has that knowledge. So the way that we help students create products that are actually better is by teaching them to learn new things by making tests, by prototyping, and by teaching themselves things that no one else in the world knows about that specific product um, and how users interact with that product. So what does this look like? So um, this is a project that students do usually in the first design class, uh, they're sophomores. And these students are designing chopsticks. But they're designing chopsticks for one specific person. And their task is to, to watch that person, take that person out to lunch, take that person out to dinner, watch them use the chopsticks, and ask them, right, try to understand how they experience chopsticks, how those chopsticks make them feel about themselves. Are they confident users? Are they uh, embarrassed users? All of that psychology that's a part of that chopstick experience can then be used to design a product that makes that experience better for that particular user. The next thing they're doing is they're prototyping, right? They're using, using a process of testing, of building and testing, building and testing, to develop unique knowledge about how that user interacts with this new product, right? So that the understanding that they get of these new products and how the users interact with them isn't something that they can learn from reading any book. It's not something I could tell them, right? I don't know. So they're building new knowledge using this prototyping process. And they're arriving at new results, right? So this is a product that's for a very specific person, right? And that person has specific struggles with chopsticks. And this is the solution for their, their unique, particular experience. Alongside this, we're teaching um, uh, a couple systems design classes. So what does this mean? So in this class, students are looking at um, big problems, complex problems, problems that typically um, can't be solved, uh, where, the, where the solution to the problem isn't always right next to the problem itself. Right? You have to look at a complex web of interrelationships to really understand what's happening and make, um, make an effective intervention. So this student is looking at the effects of Hurricane Maria. And what they identified was that when these huge weather events happen, the communication networks that we use to keep people aware, to direct people to the right places, collapses. You know, cell phones don't work, uh, TVs don't work, radios come down. So what he designed was a low-tech communication system that used noise-producing devices, like sirens, horns, 
um, visible uh, low-tech devices like balloons that could be raised up, and uh, visual signals that were uh, simple to power, so light-emitting devices, that could replace our more sophisticated uh, communication systems when those systems collapse under duress. So what happens when all these things come together? So this is Providence, this is Wicked and Street, and actually there's a um, really cool uh, block party there today if you wanna go check these benches out. Um, the street is closed down. So this student is taking all of those things, right, and putting them together into a product that uh, really makes life better uh, for the street of Providence. So looking at the street as a system. So you have businesses that are using the street, you have pedestrians that are using the street, you have buses, you have trees growing. So how do you create an intervention that protects the trees, that supports the businesses, that supports the pedestrians, that doesn't interfere with cars, right? That's a really complex problem, wreaking a lot of interrelated things. And you're asking, how does this intervention affect all of those things um, in that complex system? At the same time, you're also asking yourself, how do I make, a pro uh, you know, make this intervention create amazing experiences for the end users? The goal of this bench is to create an opportunity for conversations you wouldn't otherwise have. So how do I create a bench that, one, makes it acceptable for two people to sit next to each other that, they don't, that don't know each other? That's an awkward interaction. So the shape of the bench is designed specifically for that. So you have a little bit of distance, a little bit of acceptable space. And that comes from an understanding of what people consider acceptable personal space, which is you know, a really complicated thing. At the same time, you want to create the opportunity for those two people to turn to each other and talk. So the, it's a balancing act, and it reflects a really sensitive understanding of how people think about the space around them. And finally, you have to prototype to really understand whether that's working. Right? You can't just draw a line on a, on a piece of paper and assume that that bench will perform um, as you intend. So it's about you know, cutting out plywood, having people sit on the plywood, and actually watching what they do. So this is our goal uh, you know, in design and in product design at Johnson & Wales is to prepare, prepare students for this economy, this, this new economy where um, design is actually being inserted into all different kinds of industries. And our students are ready to add value using these three core skills, understanding users, understanding complex systems and how to intervene in them, and an ability to prototype to build new knowledge. How badly do you want fork chopsticks? I want, I need them. Uh, yeah, I should, put a, should I put a price on that slide? You should. Did you name them? Is it? It's not mine. I, I got to ask for the prices. Flop sticks? <laughs> chork? Yeah. Neither I, we of those did, really yeah. work. I'll do, I'll do better. Um, all right, so let's take a brief moment, get some questions. You guys have to have questions. Uh, we have a microphone, but you guys have just kind of been shouting them out. That's my friend Elizabeth who has a question. OK, great. Um, what made you want to take this major at Johnson & Wales? Okay, so it's pretty crazy because I am originally from New Jersey. I, <laughs> I, I had a program back in high school, which was like hospitality and tourism. But then after experiencing and getting my first job, I was like, okay, I love technology. I like video games, so I want to work at Best Buy. So after working at Best Buy, I was like, yeah, I want to learn more about technology, Intel, Dell, HP. So I kept looking at programs in New Jersey, and I came across a few tech schools. But then I get this brochure from Johnson & Wales University. And I was like, okay, no, <laughs> no application fee. I have the application, I can just submit it. And I was like, yeah, it's in Providence. I've never been to Providence, Rhode Island. Why not? I'm gonna go for it. And I signed, I, I submitted my application and I looked at the programs and they all seemed pretty interesting. But I was like, I like design and I like engineering. It sounds really fun. So after I submitted my application for engineering design, I got accepted and I got an academic scholarship. And I was like, yeah, I'm going in. <laughs> out of state, a new environment. You know, I'm dealing with technology. I do enjoy the design because I, I think about the smallest details, whether it's slim, it has round corners, and how people really interact with it, you know, and you, you want, the first thing that I think about is like memories and great times of gadgets that I had. So I want to continue growing and building experiences where people overall, overly have memories of these products and want to continue being, you know, evolving and innovating, making our daily lives really easy. <laughs> yeah, please do that. <laughs> Artificial intelligence and internet of things is the way to go. <laughs> How great is she? I love her. I love her. Um, I think we have time for what we'll do. Man, we don't have time. Okay, we're going to keep going, but please, one, <laughs> one more round of applause. That was so great. Thank you. 
All right. So we have our last, our last duo. It's so good. It's seriously so good. They're all so good. This one's awesome. So last but certainly not least, I am going to introduce Marshall Freeman. He's a graduate of 2006. He's the chief operating officer of the Atlanta Police Foundation. So he leads a team that manages programs and initiatives designed to prevent and decrease crime, enhance public safety infrastructure, increase police visibility, provide mid-career training to the Atlanta Police Department officers, test and acquire state-of-the-art technology for the South's largest urban police force. Uh, so this is, you know, probably one of the most topical programs that we're going to hear today. So what's pretty cool is, and actually the more I get to know him, the cooler he becomes. Uh, prior to joining the Atlanta Police Foundation, he had a successful entertainment career, including work as a choreographer, performance coach, creative director, talent manager for musicians. He's worked with uh, Aretha Franklin, Joan Rivers, the Beach Boys, American Idol winner Candace Glover. I think he said last night Justin Bieber. I got Bieber fever so bad. That's so cool. Uh, and he's produced events and concerts for the NFL, NBA, BET, National Urban League. Seriously, so awesome. So Marshall's uh, here to talk about how much goes into planning a city for the Super Bowl, which is so cool. So please help me uh, welcome Marshall. Thank you, thank you. All right. It's a whole lot to live up to. Uh, Marshall Freeman, again, class of 06 from the uh, Miami campus. So uh, while, anybody else from Miami? Yes? No? All right, that's all right. I'll be alone by myself. That's all right. Um, so while I was at Johnson Wells taking SEE, one of the things I did in my sophomore year was start my own company. So I started an entertainment management company, and I just figured that while I'm getting this education, I could, in a very practical way, create my own business plans and really use what I was learning in the classroom to ultimately help me after I graduated. So. After leaving the university in 06, started this company. Right on the left is the very first act that I signed to talent management, a band called City of God. I found them, they were six kids in the room that ultimately could play and make songs and they had a MySpace page. I took that band from in that room all the way to signing the record deal with Warner Brothers. Right on the right hand side is a, <coughs> a songwriting duo called A Plus. They just won their very first Grammy at this Grammy Awards this year. And together again, we worked on albums, Justin Bieber, Mary J. Blige, Beyonce, and a few others, which was an awesome time uh, in my life. Then Candace Glover, another act that I signed to personal management as well, her post-American Idol career. And then again, touring the world, doing promoter repping, tour management, production management for Rita Franklin, the Beach Boys. I did their 50th reunion tour, uh, Joan Rivers, Carol Burnett, and a few others. So again, Fun time, this was all exciting until I got married in 2015. Once you get married, you're not gonna say, I'm going on tour and I'll see you eight months later. <clears throat> so that was the end of that. It was time to get a real job and welcome to the real world. So I applied for a job at the Atlanta Police Foundation, <clears throat> an entry level job as an event coordinator, something that again was exciting to me that I knew I could do. And I moved up from event coordinator in three years to being chief operating officer. So as you guys know, thank you very much. Appreciate that. So as you know, Atlanta played host to uh, Super Bowl 53 this year. So my role as chief operating officer was again to work with the mayor and the chief of police to ultimately lead the safety and security strategy for planning the Super Bowl. So uh, all of the work all happened for me prior to the Super Bowl the day of. So I spent the day of the Super Bowl, the actual game standing on the field. This is my POV from my cell phone, standing on the field right at the 50 yard line watching the entire game, which was a boring game, sorry. So <laughs> right at uh, <coughs> third quarter, I left and decided to hightail home and actually beat the traffic. So uh, I watched the uh, end of the game from the house. So let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of what the Super Bowl looked like. So a 10-day operational period. Again, 10 days leading up to the Super Bowl was my biggest uh, responsibilities. Three events a day and a whole lot uh, happening. We actually loaded in starting January 2nd, so that gives you an idea of understanding the game actually happened on February 3rd, about a month of time that we loaded into the city. All the folks from the NFL descended on the city, and uh, we really worked hard to get everything up and rolling for it. Major departure day was February 4th, of course, an influx of people actually leaving from the city out through the airport. Great thing is that Atlanta has a huge airport, actually the world's busiest airport, so we were able to really facilitate that pretty easily. Uh, tons of hotels in the city and over a million folks actually in the city for the Super Bowl. 10,000 volunteers also helped us to uh, make those events happen, which again were uh, awesome. So backing up to the planning, if you imagine from that 10-day period, a whole year before, 
uh, we really started the actual active planning and really figuring out what we were going to do. So first thing we did was research. We went up to Minneapolis for Super Bowl 52 to really understand what did they do, what was successful, what worked, what didn't work. We kind of shared best practices with the police department there. Then secondly, we appointed our leadership. So figuring out again from our chief of police, uh, our federal partners, the FBI, uh, Secret Service, Homeland Security, who would actually do what. We assigned everybody into these roles we'll talk about in a second. And then we broke up into committees. Really the entire city um, broke up into these committees that ultimately were responsible for different things during the actual Super Bowl. And then lastly, we identified the challenges that we have in the city of Atlanta. So this is actually what our leadership structure looked like. So there was the public safety executive committee that we had, an actual commander, again, which all funneled down to these areas, logistics, um, working on, again, uh, risk management, emergency preparedness, um, as well as um, transportation. So then from there, we worked on our challenges. So Atlanta was very unique for the Super Bowl here. Um, I worked on the Super Bowl Jacksonville as well, which again was polar opposite. Uh, within this same little three block radius was every single event for the Super Bowl, that whole 10 day period, which is very unique to Atlanta. So we have Mercedes-Benz Stadium, you've got State Farm Arena, the Georgia War Congress Center, uh, you also have Centennial Olympic Park, all within those same three blocks. Right around those three blocks were all of our major hotels where mostly everyone would stand. So if you imagine, again, now you've got millions of people in such a concentrated area, which is very unique to the city of Atlanta. So that was challenging for us. Secondly, traffic. Who's been to Atlanta before? All right, perfect. So you understand Atlanta absolutely has the worst traffic in the entire world, right? Yes, perfect. So closing a couple of streets around that downtown footprint, especially when you have the businesses in that same community, was a huge challenge for us. Just closing one street would actually interrupt the daily flow of traffic in a, in a very significant way. So that was a, a huge challenge for us as well. And then we have Marta, nowhere close to being like a New York City or anything like that. Martyr goes from like here to the back of the room. That's about it. But we did extend the service for Martyr to again try to help to alleviate some of the uh, the strains on the streets. And then lastly, um, our wonderful city council decided that they would uh, extend the hours of alcohol drinking um, at the nightclubs. So they passed an ordinance that said during the Super Bowl period you could actually serve alcohol and pour to 4 a.m. Again, very unique thing to Atlanta because that's something that we're never used to. So that took a whole lot of understanding what will we do with law enforcement and safety and security to again make sure that everybody was protected. So then um, how did we kind of do this? First thing we did was we stood up a JOC, a Joint Operation Center, where we put inside of one room everybody, all of the 80 agencies that helped us to do this Super Bowl. Again, all the federal partners, police agencies, the other jurisdictions, put them in the same room so we could share information. As you can imagine, a communication amongst everybody was a huge challenge and an issue. So uh, we uh, also brought in technology into that same center. Atlanta has uh, 11,700 cameras in the city of Atlanta. So we also evaluated where could we make improvements to the network, again, now that we would have such a large event in the city. And then lastly, the visiting public safety officials was a group of folks that are actually responsible for the next two Super Bowls. So just like we went to Minneapolis and they shared best practices, I hosted four days uh, the folks from Miami and from Tampa, the entire chiefs of police, their heads of Secret Service. And we shared again what was working, what wasn't working, what was working, and they kind of get on the ground level of really digging into how we were planning the Super Bowl and approaching it. So then, um, how we do? Kind of our scorecard, um, the NFL named uh, this Super Bowl 53 the most prepared uh, Super Bowl, which was awesome for us. They also said we were the most walkable Super Bowl in history. Again, that talks about those major hotels in that same downtown footprint. So we took that challenge and made it a big opportunity for us. The day of the Super Bowl, we confiscated 28 drones, um, which was fun and interesting to see the uh, Attorney General say, hey, take it down. It was, it was cool to me. Um, the uh, arrest for it surprisingly only have 14 people ejected from the stadium, which uh, me and Sarah were talking yesterday and she was like, only 14. I'm like, yeah, actually only 14. So I think you pay so much money for a ticket. So everybody just figured that they're not gonna ruin the uh, opportunity there. And then all in all, no major incidents. So the Super Bowl kind of went off without, uh, without any incidents. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. So again, 
great time in my life. Again, when you talk about um, bridging a gap between entertainment and uh, kind of where I am today, um, one of the things I always say that I think is critical that you kind of identify the things that make you happy, the things that inspire you, that inspire you and the things that kind of keep you going. So for me, working in the concert and music industry first, that moment where you're at an event <clears throat> or at a concert, you're waiting on your favorite artist to come on, the lights go down and the crowd starts to scream is always the moment that I live for. So at the Super Bowl, I got a chance again from that same moment at the 50 yard line to capture that moment and kind of bridge my worlds together. So. Ejections, that still blows my mind. I've been kicked out of happy hour before 7 p.m. More, more times than that. <laughs> Marshall, you're amazing. That was really great. Thank you so much. So our last presenter for the day is Lee Eskelson, and I, I practiced his, uh, his title because I was screwing it up yesterday. So Lee is an associate professor in sports entertainment event management in the College of Hospitality Management. I get it? All right. So Lee, um, you know, if he's tired today, it's because my boyfriend and I asked him questions for like three hours last night because he, he also has one of the coolest jobs and it's, it's, it's just, it's also super important. And he has some pretty cool accreditations like certified venue executive, trained crowd manager, certified trainer for techniques for effective alcohol management, all these things that I didn't even know existed. Prior to his teaching career, Lee was involved in the development and management of seven entertainment and sports venues over a 20 year span. These included uh, Madison Square Garden, Manchester Arena, the Mullen Center, uh, Providence Civic Center, the list goes on and on. And uh, he's going to come up here and touch on how our graduates plan for the safety and security of guests and spectators of events in venues of all sizes. So please join me in welcoming Lee. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Uh, it's that time. Good afternoon. Uh, before beginning my remarks, I want to thank Sarah for moderating this catch out today. Please give her a big hand. Well done. I also want to congratulate Marshall on his fantastic successes. We look forward to seeing more of his significant accomplishments as he continues his career in entertainment and sports. So please give him another round of applause. And then the last thing I want to say before I get started is I'm the only thing standing between you and uh, a taste of Jebu, so I'm going to be concise in my remarks because I know you're all hungry after seeing those chopsticks. You're probably saying, how can I use those this afternoon? So I'll be concise. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, I've been involved in the sports and entertainment and event industry uh, for over 30 years. I've also been able to help students understand the business that has been a labor of love for me. As a faculty member here at Johnson & Wales in sports and entertainment and event management for the past 17 years, I've really enjoyed helping students understand this fantastic business. The combination of my professional career and my academic career have enabled me to assist students with not only internships, but also entry-level jobs. Uh, created in 2000, the Sports Entertainment and Event Management degree program, uh, go there, um, has grown to be the largest major uh, in the College of Hospitality Management. Our students graduate and are employed in many types of careers such as venue management in stadiums, arenas, convention centers, theaters, performing arts, in event management, in life cycle events like weddings and reunions, uh, in sports management and professional collegiate and amateur sports, and in entertainment management in concert and special event planning. So what do our students do when they leave here? Our students do a number of different things. They go into venue management, ticket sales manager, premium services manager. So those of you who have been fortunate enough to sit in the suite before, some of our students are involved in that line of work. Uh, event management, concert production. Um, our students are helping with the Wildcat Wahoo, which is a big event on campus this spring. Uh, wedding planners, uh, sports coach, and athletic director. I am tired this morning, so I made some notes just to make sure I didn't forget I was supposed to say. So what, we're, uh, what we try to do here is, is educate uh, students for the next generation of guests and guests like you, that uh, Marshall had a chance to, 
keep safe and secure at the Super Bowl. So uh, what do we, there's two major principles that we educate our students in. The first and foremost is keeping everybody safe and secure. As you know, in this society and in the, and in the business of sports and entertainment, that's primary. Just look at the news over the last couple of years and without getting into kind of a, a difficult topic, you know that safety and security is first and foremost in everything that you do, not only in your personal lives, but what we do in our professional lives. The other thing that we do is we like to provide an exceptional event experience. You know, when you pay all this money to go to the Super Bowl, when you pay all this money to go to concerts and other events, you know, you're paying for a great experience and it's our job to make sure that we give that to you. But you want us to do that in a way that we refer to as operational transparency. So when you come to the event, we want you to leave and make sure that the only thing you remember is what a fabulous experience you had. You don't want to remember anything about how, you know, the negative impressions that the staff left you with or God forbid there was no paper supplies in the bathroom or the, the, the beer was cold, the beer was hot and the hot dogs were cold. And, and so what we are educating our students to do is to provide that exceptional event, to do it in a safe and secure environment, but also do it in a way that you don't feel like we're looking over your shoulder all the time. So how do we do this? Well, we have a tough challenge, as my, my, uh, my colleagues uh, have told you about their great uh, facilities that they have on campus. We don't have major stadiums. We don't have major arenas. We don't have convention centers on our campus, but we're very fortunate that we've developed these wonderful relationships with all the public assembly venues and event planners in our area. So we have relationships with Gillette. We have relationships with the Dunkin' Donuts Center. We have relationships with PPAC. We have relationships with all these facilities that we farm our students out into, and those become our laboratories. Those become the places that we make sure that our students get great experience. We've just um, uh, announced a, a relationship with the, the Delaware North, which is the owner of the, the TD Garden and the Boston Bruins, and we'll be doing a lot of work with them in the future. So our goal is not so much to help students understand what they should be doing on campus, but our goal is to uh, put them through classes that they understand the basic principles and practices on campus so they can take those into venues and events off campus. So we have courses like safety, security, and risk management. We talk about all the basic principles and practices in that area. We have event management, which is, it could be anything from the Olympics to a wedding planner to anything else. Uh, ancillary services and red room, generally that's the, the business of food service. It's not the, what my colleagues do in terms of pre food preparation, but more so, you know, how do you keep a, 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 a venue with its food service uh, safe and secure? And one of the big areas that we talk about is alcohol management. We have a certificate program that we actually uh, make our students go through. And then the last one is international sports entertainment and event management. You know the world is getting a lot smaller. We have students, uh, we have a young lady that's in a stadium in Sweden right now. We have students that work all over the world. We have a lot of students that come here and go back to their home countries to work in sports and entertainment. So it's important for us to make sure that they understand uh, what is, you know, what, what the basic tenets are here and how they take those home and are successful at home with those. So I mentioned a couple of certi certification programs. Uh, those are things we can do on campus and that we feel are very important to our, our students. One is the Train Crowd Manager Certificate through the International Association of Venue Managers, which I've been involved with for over 30 years. I've actually written two textbooks and I'm in, my, in, uh, in the process of writing my third textbook for IVM that basically teaches the principles and best practices for sports entertainment venue and event management. Um, we also have the techniques for effective alcohol management. That's one of, it's an interesting course because that course was actually, or certif certification program was actually designed for, uh, for, for, for venues. So the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, all those major venues, Major League Soccer, all those venues use this program to train their staffs in understanding what the implications are of alcohol service to their fans. Again, you know, trying to create that exceptional event experience and also trying to create that, uh, that, that safe and secure environment, alcohol can screw both of those things up really quickly. So this is not just a class where it's for bartenders or people that sell alcohol. This is for the entire venue. And one of the interesting things that I found in, in teaching this class, I've, I've, uh, I've been recertified twice and have, we've had over a thousand students go through this program. It's not just important for them to learn about what they're gonna do when they get out into venues and events, but it's also kind of a lifetime lesson for them. Because as you know, a lot of students, when they come to campus, it's the first time that they've had free will in terms of choosing how much alcohol they drink and how that alcohol affects their school life, how it affects their personal life, how it affects their relationships. So this is kind of an eye-opening experience for them in learning about blood alcohol and all that kind of stuff that goes into what happens when you put an alcoholic beverage to your lips. So I found personally that I've enjoyed teaching it not only for what they're gonna need when they go out into their careers, but it's also, I, it's kind of a tip of the hat, like these are the things you should pay attention to in your personal life. These are the things you should pay attention to when you're on campus and not just for you, 
but for the people around you, your, your, your fellow students that aren't in this class, that may be sitting next to you on a bar stool or somewhere at a keg party, that might be drinking a little bit too much alcohol. This is a way for you to help keep their lives safe and secure uh, in your personal life as well. So that we, feel, we find that that's a very important certification program that we put them through, but it's, it's more than just a certification program for their career. So these are the two associations that we have been um, uh, uh, involved in. The International Association of Venue Managers, again, is one that I'm personally involved in and have been for over 30 years. TEAM is an organization that i become a certified trainer for uh, twice now, and, and it's important. And we tell our students that not only do you need to learn the things that we teach you in the classrooms, but again, you need to go out and get involved in these associations. You need to go out into the community and really get involved in venues and events because that is your laboratory. Uh, that is your, your space where you're going to learn, much like your, your classmates do in the culinary lab, just like my, your classmates do in the, the new engineering building. You know, your, your venue to learn things in is away from campus. And we, we help them create relationships. As I've said, we, all my colleagues, we stay very involved in terms of other venues and events around not only Rhode Island, but, but around, around the country. And we, we make sure that our students get out into those venues and events to get as much experience as possible. So... In closing, on behalf of all my SEM colleagues, we are dedicated to providing an exceptional educational experience to all of our SEM students and prepare them for an exciting and enjoyable career in whatever sports, entertainment, or event, or venue management they choose. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Enjoy the taste of Jay Wu. Sarah? All right, so we have just about 10 minutes left. Before we do some closing remarks, let's, uh, let's give these guys one question. So it does, uh, yeah, and a round of applause, yeah. <laughs> you have any questions, let's get one question. I think we have one here. Um, Mike's coming. How ready do you feel you were for terrorist type uh, threats? at the Super Bowl. How comfortable standing here today would you evaluate that readiness? Sure, I think we were very ready for it. And I think, again, it, it is a uh, testament to a lot of, A, the technology that is uh, in place today that is utilized to, again, uh, scan social media, um, the internet, and just you can really understand how to analyze threats by using technology and the things that are in place. And then secondly, with all the help of the federal partners, again, us working together with the FBI, uh, the Homeland Security Director, the Attorney General, all of those folks all in one room together, you've got like the biggest and brightest and the best of the best there. So I think that hands down, we were absolutely prepared for anything that would have took place that day. Let's get, let's get one more question, sure. No, not from him. <laughs> I don't know if I was allowed to do that, but I went for it. I like Kevin, don't like Tom Brady, and I'm a Giants fan. But at the end of the game, Tom Brady got absolutely Sure. No. That's, Can you repeat that's the question? Sure. sure. Yeah, so he asked the question about um, if you kind of watch the end of the game, um, as soon as it was over, um, there was an influx of reporters and media and all of those folks that ran like to Tom Brady, like where you could tell he was like physically uncomfortable. And so kind of the way that um, that part of it works is that that is really a direct result of the actual NFL because um, what happens is that the NFL, each team kind of sets their security standards that then we go by. So um, I'm not 100% sure again why they would not have made those parameters for credentialed media to actually, to again, uh, increase the actual uh, parameter and distance that was around him at the end, but it wasn't at all in their security specs. So all we do is ultimately execute what it is, what it is that the actual team specs as being their requirement. So I agree with you, very uh, uncomfortable uh, situation at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Horrible. All right. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. I think we're, we're just about out of time, right? Yep. So we're going to wrap it up. Please give all of the presenters one more round of applause. They were awesome. I just, I just had to take a shower and show up. They were, uh, they were very impressive, so thank you guys. Yeah, and I encourage you to find them for the rest of the weekend, whether it's at Taste of Jay Wu or the big party later or whatever, and, and get to know them, because even me, I had to drastically abbreviate their bios. They're just a, an incredibly impressive group of people, and it's been a lot of fun to get to know you guys, and you've certainly inspired me, so thank you for what you did today. That was really great. Um, so if you have been inspired, 
like me, like I was, you can help support these academic programs and the development of our students by donating to the uh, JWU Fund. So I think the, yep, directions are right up there. So you just text JWU Reunion to 71777 to give now because this place needs to keep creating impressive humans like this. We have to keep doing it and this program supports that. So if you could donate, that would be amazing. So lastly, but certainly not least, I am going to introduce Lori Zabata, Director of Alumni Relations to bring us home, get us one step closer to food and drinks. So please welcome Lori. Wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? One more round of applause. We gotta do it one more time. All the presenters, our alumni, thank you for taking time out of your um, busy careers to put this on for us today. I know that it was such a huge undertaking. Um, a lot of time and attention and work and effort went into this and we really appreciate it. Our faculty that um, were part of this presentation, thank you. Um, taking time outside of the classroom, all of your work that you do with our students to put this together and work in collaboration with our impressive alumni, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much, really great, really great. I would like to invite Liza Gentile up here um, with me. She is the driving force behind the planning and execution of Cat Chat, and I'd love her to join me on stage after a, a round of applause for her too. So um, this program started last year. Um, I'm so happy to see some past presenters in the audience. Thank you for being here. Um, but this was really an idea that Liza had in which to present some of the wonderful things that we're doing here on this campus and share it with our alumni population while you're here for a reunion. And this has um, absolutely become a labor of love for her. Um, this is, um, as you can imagine, a large undertaking in addition to her regular work and the orchestration of the rest of the weekend. So thank you so much for your efforts. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hand out gifts because right. that's the fun part, yeah. All right, so we just want to give you all a little token because we're so appreciative of what you've all done for us up here today. So I'm just going to call you up one at a time. So Kevin Murray, come on up. Yes. Todd Seaforth. Thank you. Alexa Espinal. Walter Zesk, come on up. Marshall Freeman. And Lee Eskelson. Thank you all so much. And Sarah Sorelli, last but not least. All right, so just one more round of applause for our amazing presenters. Certainly for your efforts, there's not enough applause, so we'll just continue to applaud you out, the, out of the room, maybe. Um, but thank you all for spending your morning and into your afternoon with us. We hope that you enjoyed today as much as we did. Um, but are we ready to eat? Yes, I know, my stomach has been growling. I've been eating peanuts, um, but that's a secret, and I just outed myself. But um, Wildcat Wheels are outside to take you to Harborview for Taste of Jaywoo. So feel free to exit out of the building, up in the lobby, take a right down the stairs, and right outside will be the buses. So thank you so much for being here. And we're going to do a picture. So hang tight. <laughs>